Okay, well, thank you for everybody for coming to our number 50 Slither. And for those of you that didn't catch on, that is our tin celebration. Tin, everybody, element number 50. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, and we have um, with us Megan Porter, who is from Indiana University, and she is going to talk with us about experiential learning in a large lecture course. Is this mission impossible? Um, and I will let her take it away. Thank you, Megan. All right, hi. Um... Let me go ahead and share my screen. It's been so long since I've had to share anything on Zoom. It's kind of nice. All right. So there we go. This is kind of what my teaching looks like. Um, this is not me. I'm not on stage, but I definitely teach in classrooms that are actual theaters with stages. Um, so and this is about what my students look like. So I do want to kind of orient you to what we think about as large at IU because it's very different depending on where you are. So I focused on kind of our incoming sequence. We serve primarily majors from other departments. So not only are our courses really large, they're also not actually going on in chemistry for the most part. Um, about, we estimate 20% of our incoming, like our first four courses, um, are actually going to go on into chemistry. Most are biology, psych, or neuroscience, and they're really only taking our classes for pre-med. That's the idea. So these are our main required courses, and they are taught every semester, and these enrollments stay every semester. So we're doing this every time we teach the course. Our general chemistry course is around 700 students, and we teach it in two sections. So that picture on the last slide really does look accurate. We teach in a classroom that holds just about 350 and we have just about 350 in every section. Um, so that is one thing when I think about large too, is thinking about in what capacity are you interacting with the students? Do you might, you might have 700 students, but are you interacting in over eight different sections or in our case, two different sections? So how many are you seeing at once? Our organic chemistry one and two, we teach a one, two, one sequence. So ours have one semester of gen chem, then going straight into organic. Um, they're around four to 600 students each, 600 for that organic one, 400 for organic two. Again, they're only taught in two sections. And then you get to the inorganic chemistry, which is taught every semester. And that one varies about 120 to 180, depending on the semester. And they're all taught at once. Our lab courses have fairly similar enrollments. So that is how the instructors interact with students. And then they also have a weekly recitation section with their TA. And if I say AI, I apologize. We call them associate instructors, which are AIs, but I, especially with everything coming out right now about AI, we're trying in talks to do TA so that people know what we're talking about. So, um, but even those, they're supposed to be our smaller, more intimate gatherings, but they are 40 to 45 students with one TA. So that is definitely, you know, still a larger section of students. Um, so when I was looking up, uh, kind of when I started thinking about experiential learning in my classes, I looked at this and kind of some examples that I have in a couple of slides and pretty much thought, don't know how to do it and I'm still experimenting. So after this, I'm, I'm hoping other people have ideas, but the main tenets of it are that they have some sort of concrete experience. So something that the students are actively involved in, um, not just, you know, listening to a professor lecture at the front of the room. And then they have some sort of reflection um, about the, what they observed in that experience. So really the idea is looking at what is their existing knowledge and how does this experience fit into it? Um, and if you can find something that kind of teases out some of the what they seem to be as inconsistencies between that experience and knowledge, it can be a really powerful um, uh, way of approaching it. And then the fancy is abstract conceptualization, but really this is what are they learning? So really concrete learning from that experience. And then some sort of experimentation where they can test these new ideas. So a lot of people, when you think about the students being involved in the process, in some reading, you will hear about flipped classroom in it, which I do, and we have slithers on it. So I wasn't going to get into that and including it. There is a little bit of a difference. It's not just that, you know, the students are working on a problem set in class, but it's having these other aspects as well. Are they actually reflecting on their knowledge? Are they 
putting it all together? And then are they doing something that next step? So are you really creating a cycle? Um, so just kind of put that in there. And then uh, I really liked this when I started thinking about it, which is looking at the elements. So their experiences are chosen for learning potential. So not the idea of I'm just going to have students do things for the sake of I can say I'm I'm doing some new teaching technique. Um, so this can look for a lot of different reasons, practicing and deepening new skills, encountering novel situations. And then one of the things I like is letting students have the ability to make mistakes or learn from those mistakes um, without necessarily, you know, on an exam where it's going to penalize them to make those mistakes. Um, and then getting students actively engaged in asking questions in the solving um, the problems in their decisions, what approach are they going to take? Um, and then reflecting during and after the experiences. This is really kind of for chemistry where I think that critical thinking. Uh, and then the last two are ones that we don't always think about when you think about experiential learning. Because I tend, I know I tended to think about content, but that the students are engaged in some way. So it can be into the intellectual part, but it can also be an emotional engagement, social or physical. And that social can also have those relationships that are developed and nurtured. So those relationships could be teaching team to the student or student to student or instructor to student or any of those. But it's not just engaging in content, but are they engaging in the community? So that's kind of my brief background on it. Here are the traditional experiences. So a lot of us think about internships, service learning courses, where it's more course-based work, um, clinical uh, experiences, student teaching, and then you know more towards us a lot of times, the undergrad research experiences or community research, and then field work and study abroad. And this is all great, but in someone who, when I'm sitting there looking at my 350 students, I, there, I can't find 350 internships. Um, our service learning courses, we don't, they're capped, um, most because of who we work with, but we're not putting 350 in a service learning course. Um, and not all of them are going to teach. So even in our undergrad research experiences for IU, we have a lot of them, but they are either individually in the labs working with graduate students, or we do have some more like cure based, or we have another program called Ashore, which is also about getting undergraduates in research. But all of those just due to lab spaces are really low enrollment courses. So when I looked at these, I was like, huh, that's it's not going to happen. But it really took some changing and this idea of those are great, but can I just get students to engage? So what I did was kind of put together some of what we've tried in our lecture courses. Some work better than others. Um, but the first is using demos. A lot of us use demos just because, well, I don't know about y'all. I love demos, but my students also really love demos. I think I enjoy them as much as they do. Um, but it does actually allow a large number of students to practice this cycle, even if they are not doing the individual demo themselves. Um, so if they were in lab, they might be doing the experiment themselves. If they're in lecture, we can at least do the demonstration. So with the experience, I try to kind of put all of these in context of the learning cycle. So the students are along on our demonstration journey, right? They're going to see us perform the demo. Um, and then we give them time to reflect on what they experience. So we might ask some guiding questions, kind of depends a little bit on the demonstration, kind of depends a little bit on what content we're looking at. Um, but really just thinking about what did they see? What did they observe? Um, can they tie it to anything that we've seen before? Then we bring it all back to connect to the lecture content. Um, so one of the ways kind of a demo, and it has to be the simplest demo that we've done, but it works really well for students is we walk in the very first day with a thing of liquid nitrogen and we dump it on the floor, right? So you get the huge, you know, which is what we love. Um, but we've actually used this demo a lot and we start asking students questions. We just say, what did you observe? And they're like, well, there's no puddle on the floor. Um, if they're in the front, my feet got really cold. Uh, and they start putting that together. And then as we go through the semester, we don't do it all on the first day. When we talk about kinetics and the rate of a reaction, we'll link back to it saying, hey, when we threw the liquid nitrogen on the floor, you know, how quickly did, did you know, you stop seeing liquid? Or did you see any liquid left over when we talk about how far to the products? And so we can keep bringing it back and helping them connect that. And then we always like to do follow-up. So then we're going to ask them, you know, what happens if we pour it into hot water? You know, what do they predict is going to happen? 
Um, and so we kind of bring all those students along and as we do this. So I am a huge fan of demos for large classes. And then this is what we call our field work. So this is getting something outside the classroom. And this is where we send them on a hunt for in just their day-to-day -day life for some example of what we've been talking about in lecture. So, um, you know, for our upper level ones, for inorganic, we have sent them to find just real world examples of different point groups. So pub caps are a great one. Um, but we've sent them to find different examples of point groups. We have asked them about you know, temperature changes. What is something in your life that you interacted with today where the temperature changed? And we'll bring that back eventually to enthalpy. And so they bring it in and we do a lot of our um, kind of field work in our recitation sections because even though they're still fairly large, they are smaller, right? So you can break them up into groups um, and get them to talk if we want them to share out to the entire uh, section. If we just want them to talk in groups and kind of reflect that way, we can do this in large lectures without a problem. So each student will bring in their examples. If you want to do it for grading, which we have found if we provide some incentive, we'll get more students engaged in it. Um, then they can submit their individual examples and then they can get together in their groups and discuss those examples. And then if you're doing it in recitation, oftentimes we'll have one group pick the one example and then they're going to teach how that example relates to our lecture content to the rest of the recitation. So we're also bringing in some of that student teaching experience um, as we do that. If they're in large lecture classes, usually we just ask, you know, is there a group that wants to share what their favorite example was and go from there? And then uh, if you're in recitation, we like to get them out of the classroom. I don't know about you all, but we have a lot of uh, our literature courses that are very small and we walk past them as they're having class outside. And we're heading to this, you know, giant lecture hall. And so we get ours out of the classroom sometimes. After they've gone through those first three steps, we'll have the groups head out and just search campus and say, you know, find some examples of X, Y, or Z and meet back in 20 minutes. And they are on a hunt to see either what, you know, group finds what the class rates is the most fun example. Sometimes it's how many examples you can find. And we turn it into a competition and we usually provide baked goods for the winners. So that's just us. So, um, Meg, Megan, do you, have, do you have, I'm just curious, do you have either in Gen Chem or inorganic, do you ever have, do you have TAs in there with you at all or peer instructors or anything like that? Yeah. So that, that is later, but absolutely. Okay. That is the way we know that that's fine. I'll say it. So um, for example, in our general chemistry, we have, uh, so we have 700 students. We have four graduate AIs that actually teach our recitations. And then we have one grad AI uh, TA who is a, like a head TA. They kind of do a lot more of the organizational stuff um, that we need. And then we use a lot of undergraduate uh, students that volunteer. So I have a, I have a slide because I always like to rep them. They're amazing. Um, and so we do break down that ratio, still large. So for the 180 and inorganic, I get one graduate student to help. So but they are, those undergrads are indispensable for that. Okay. So um, my students, probably my students' favorite is what we just call get up and move. We just literally do that. We get up and move. Um, so two examples, one is myself and the other started as a joke, but it worked really well. Um, I was trying to demonstrate why metallic systems, the conduction can decrease as you increase the temperature. And so I had students, large lecture halls, right? Nice stairs that run right up the center or on the sides. And I had them time me running from the bottom to the top. And then I walked back down to the bottom. And then I had the students, they were going to be my little nuclei moving around. They just started walking back and forth across the aisle. And then I had to run from the bottom to the top and they timed me again. Actually, I don't even think they timed me. I think we all just started laughing too hard, but it was obviously slower. And then the other one that we've also done is one of my students was the president of the IU Breakdance Club. So he took it upon himself to figure out how to demonstrate CFT terms like high spin and low spin and paramagnetic and diamagnetic um, using breakdance moves. And it was amazing. They like did head spins on the table for high spin and then like underneath the table for low spin. It was amazing. So doing something that's going to demonstrate a concept, and it's great too if you don't explain it ahead of time, like just give a general, 
and then let them do in that reflection. You know, so I would say, hey, they're going to break down about some CFT. Let's see what they've got for us. And then we reflect, okay, what connections can we make? Why might they have chosen to move that way? What were we trying to express Um, and really kind of get into that discussion? And then we like to challenge them to do it on their own. So sometimes we'll do the first three steps in our large lecture, and then we'll do that experimentation step in the recitation so that they can really get up and actually move, um, but also so they can have that group discussion with it. So there are definitely, if you have those recitations, that's a nice way sometimes to bring in that experiment part that might not work as well in a large class. And then um, this one, every time I do it, I'm really nervous. And every time I do it, my students it just blow me away. So I think sometimes, and, and I'm sure we've all had this experience, where you can tell a student is just parroting back what you're saying and they have no idea what they're saying, like no idea. They just know that you said those words. And so this is, we will, their experience is having to take something we've learned and explain it to a non-chemist. So sometimes it's in an analogy. They can use whatever art form a lot of times they want. So I've had students sing songs. I've had some make comic books. I they're, That's what always makes me nervous because they always talk about not liking creativity and then they're just amazing with it. Um, but the idea is they have to take out that jargon. They have to explain it to someone who, you know, if you, I always joke that if you're you know, parents aren't chemists, if you were going to chat with them about it, how would you explain this? Or if you have a younger sibling, um, and then they bring them in and talk about them. They can also, like I said, any of these, you can have them submit individual things on, we use Canvas if you want to track it and then get into those groups. We do find for that reflection and conceptualization, getting into those smaller groups is helpful because you don't need 700 examples. Um, but it it gives it gets all of them engaged in it. Um, and then we kind of have them teach the next group about their group's favorite. So if it's four students all created comic books, they'll teach their pick their favorite and then teach the next group and see how that goes. So again, getting them to take some of that student teaching. And then they can create their own examples as well, like additional examples. They can change examples, try a second one. Um, but do something with it to take that step further. If you have less time, you can switch that experience into finding the examples first of places where this has been done and then just have the experiment having them create their own. So you can kind of keep it as a one step instead. And then I personally like this one. The fancy name I think is Jigsaw, if I remember correctly, but it's just, you know, we don't need to be fancy. I call it you be the teacher because if I told my students Jigsaw, they're not going to know what that is. So this is letting my students teach each other. So their experience is literally the classroom setting. What have, what have they seen throughout the semester? So there's no real like special experience for this one. Um, but then in their reflection, and we can do this a couple of times out throughout the semester, I find it really helpful too, is for them to reflect on what has been the most helpful for them. What have we done? What styles have we used in class? Um, was it, you know, bringing in break dancers? But what has been the most effective for their learning? And then also kind of more of the meta aspect, what techniques is every technique effective for every aspect, right? Or does different contact, different topics have different techniques that they found more helpful? And then they each pick one technique and they pick one topic and they split up. So, you know, four people in group A and four people in group B and C and D, they rearrange their groups. So you have one from each group and then they're teaching each other. So that's kind of that jigsaw. But again, it really puts them, it also, I think, helps them build confidence um, just because they are teaching, right? But they've come up with that teaching as a group, so they don't feel quite as much pressure that it was all on them, um, which we found students are more willing to do for us. And then this is what I was going to say to Joanne. These are our undergraduate teaching interns. I love them. They are amazing. Um, we could not run our courses without them. I will absolutely say that. We have way too large of courses to do it. So this is an experiential. It's kind of different, but I really wanted to put it in. This is the experiential experiential experience um, for the UTINs as opposed to the students necessarily in the class. But it's very valuable. And it's valuable for our students because it lowers that teaching team to student ratio. But also it helps nurture relationships 
Um, a lot of our students in the class develop really close relationships to our UTINs because they're seeing the same UTINs in recitation or the same UTINs in lecture uh, the whole semester. So they're really developing those relationships. And then those UTINs can really help within a group if they aren't sure how to interact with each other or talk with each other. Those UTINs can kind of help guide those discussions. Um, we, it comes up every time, we don't pay ours. Um, and we still have about 180 uh, people willing to do an unpaid you know, UTIN uh, per semester. So we use them in both our lecture sections and our recitations. Um, in recitations, we usually have two or three. So you've taken 45 students to one TA to 45 students to you know, three or four um, teaching team members. And so that is a huge advantage. Go ahead, Joanne. Do you meet once a week outside of class? And how, and do, do does the instructor run that meeting or is there a yep. group? Or? So we have two parts to it. The first time they go through as a UTIN, we have an online one credit course that they have to take um, that is run through two of our chemistry faculty um, and our Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning has been instrumental in putting together a bunch of kind of modules focused on pedagogy and, you know, how to interact with students, how to lead discussions and not give answers, that type of stuff. So they'll go through all of that in their first semester while they're actually with us. And then the instructors also meet with them once a week. And we do more of the content and how we want it to look in our courses because um, we all use them a little bit differently. And they they are amazing. You can see there's a couple of mine. Um, both of them graduated and it was really sad. But they and like I said, we we don't pay them. Some of our other departments do. We just can't afford to. Um, but we never we never lack for it. And also, if you teach large lecture sections and you're looking for people to help out, um, one of the things that we point out is that we get to know our UTINs exceptionally well. So when they want recommendation letters for graduate school or medical school, it's a great way to not be one in 700 and have somebody really be able to talk about you as a person um, and not just the grade. So like I, said, I think that's why a lot of them do it, but they're also amazing. Oh, I have a quick question about, do, yeah. do you find that the physical space that you have, you know, with the stadium seating is an impediment to this kind of group work that you have set up? I mean, if I had an active learning classroom, I would take it in a second. Um, our largest active learning classroom on campus holds 94, so it doesn't even hold our, our small uh, ones. But the way I've kind of at least done what I can, right, I'm stuck in that space. But when I have them do groups, I don't have them do four across. I'll have them then do two and then two in front. Um, and so that group of four is across two rows. Usually the way it works out and I've just accepted that I'm okay with this is they'll work mostly as partners in their discussion and then they will come together as all four, whether it's to ask questions or have that final discussion. And I'm okay with that. Um, they're still interacting and talking to each other. And so that's kind of one of the biggest things. If the experience, there's one later that involves like paper that they need paper for. Um, I'm definitely the mean one. I give one paper per group or one paper per pair actually in that case because of the way they're seated. Um, so that they can't just individually work on them and then check their answers with each other because that is not actually having that communication. Um, so I will do that as well. But I would love, I would love a space. And our, I will point out our discussions or recitations also look like this. They are also held in pretty much the stadium style seating. And then for chemists, right? Don't forget the research. So um, especially in our general chemistry um, and even in our organic one, usually by an organic, they've kind of accepted there are reasons for what we're teaching them. But sometimes in gen chem, our students just feel like we're throwing a whole bunch of information at them and we just keep saying it'll be important later or you'll understand later when you are in your upper level classes. But students are much more engaged if they feel like there's a point and that point is not some theoretical three courses down the line. And so um, it. It is easier to do this. I will point this out for upper level classes. You have to do a lot more kind of searching for the general chemistry, but we can do it. Um, we give them data sets or literature articles with the discussion sections removed. Um, for general chemistry, we would tend to stick with like a figure 
pretty much like our, you know, one figure learning objects, right? On, on uh, Viper. So we'll stick with that because that is easier to isolate something that will match what we have covered at that point in general chemistry. By the time they get into inorganic, we're a little bit more comfortable where we can give them, a, you know, an actual article, again, chosen it carefully. Um, and then we can ask them from there. And so what they're going to do is we will just provide that. We really don't provide context for it. And what we have them get into groups and do is develop their own discussion section. So pulling on all that knowledge that they have and what they're working with with that data. So not just, oh, this is in our notes, but what is this data telling us? Because we all know real science is messy and what they see in class is not messy for the most part. And so it kind of gives them that aspect as well. Um, especially in general chemistry, most of our students, if they are going to do research, haven't done it yet. They're not into labs yet because they're first semester. Um, and then what we'll have them do is, uh, sorry, in the disc, we'll have them do their own. Then we have them get together and do a group discussion for a final draft. And sometimes we'll have them submit their own. Sometimes we have them submit just their final um, but they're going to create a final where they can really pull on other people's experience and learning as well to do that. And then for the experiment, once they've done all this and we've kind of had a class discussion then to make sure we're all on the right page, right? We didn't leave anyone behind or that they went off on a completely different tangent. What we'll do is we'll change it. Say, so, okay, here's what they did in this experiment. We're going to change the temperature or we are going to change the concentration of reactant. And then they have to provide us a data set. So what does that data look like? What would that change based on what we have already seen? Um, that one's really fun. We we have teased out a lot of misconceptions that we never would have thought of when we asked them to draw our data. Um, we just, I, I think a lot of times in gen chem, especially in thermochemistry and uh, kinetics, we get, our students get so focused on the math and sometimes I'm just grateful that they can do the math. And so I'm definitely guilty of forgetting like our math means something in chemistry. And so I think this is a good way for them to really understand that there is meaning behind our numbers or our graphs, you know, and, and not just getting caught up in that. And so the last thing I would point out is that I definitely harness technology for engagement in these classes. Um, it's definitely, I, I would say I'm a firm believer. It's not enough to just put the activities in classes. You have to have a way of holding some students accountable for it because, you know, some students are going to, they're going to engage no matter what. <gasps> Sorry, my, my son's playing video games in the background. I don't know if you hear, apparently something really good just happened. Um, but, you know, it's, it's the ones who, if they could, they like the large class because they think they can just sit there and hide, right? Um, that we're not going to notice. And unfortunately, if every seat is full, there's a chance that I'm not going to notice if you're not engaged. I can't be that in tune with every student. So I definitely harness technology to help with that. Um, we can use, in different classes, we use different things. Um, in our general chemistry, we have learning catalytics because we have it as part of our textbook. In classes where we don't have textbooks, we have Top Hat, that's through IU. Um, but they're all essentially just student response systems. We can use Canvas surveys if we want to get a little bit more um, than just like the real time. We tend to not ask um, Canvas in class because the app on the phone doesn't work great um, versus our student response systems. They do work pretty well. So we like these because we can do either low or no um, kind of no what we call no fear questions. So when we give them their experience and we ask them to reflect on it, we will force every student to do something individual first, whether it's create a prediction of why it happened or answer a question, but they're going to commit to it. They're not just going to sit there and be like, oh, I'll wait till the other person answers and then we'll make that our group answer. They will commit to it. Um, and then we also have them, then we have multiple options. Sometimes we will allow them to discuss as a group and they can change their answer. Sometimes we allow them to discuss and then they just submit a group answer um, or sometimes it's go away and then submit a final thought, you know, with before the next class period, something like that. But there is a sense of accountability that they're going to do something with this experience, not just watch it. Um, and then we can also get a little bit more of like the meta reflection as well, um, how they felt it helped or hindered their learning of a particular content. 
Um, and so that has been helpful. What we find, not gonna lie, on the more meta reflections, it does become like we're gonna scan through quickly and kind of see, you know, get general trends. We're not, you know, either we're asking only for a sentence. Sometimes we can do it as an auto uh, graded in that case. So we can see statistics, but we try not to do that too much because we sometimes we find we miss some valuable things when we're the ones that are pre-deciding their options. Um, but we do find if you can scan through even just like 50, which some people might sound like a lot to us, it sounds like very little, but if you can scan through even 50, you're going to see a lot of similar trends. Um, and that at least gives you a place to start. Um, so it allows us to quickly gauge understanding, learn from students and then provide credit. Um, for us, for them, it's a, a reason to do it. For us, I think it shows students that we value that experience, that we're not just, we are not just doing it to give them busy work, but we actually think it's going to help them learn is by giving them something for it. Um, so that's kind of what we do with it. So that's what I do in large lecture courses, kind of an overview. So if other people, I'll stop sharing my slides. But. I have I have another question, yeah. um, Megan, that was really, really awesome. Um, the I'm just 350 people, man. I just can't imagine. Um, but this is uh, to the last slide that you had there. Um, so, so if you're doing classroom response systems or something like that, you'll have some sense of you'll have some electronic record of who's there and who's mm -hmm. not there, or whatever. How do you so if a student pulls a disappearing act for a week or so, how do you follow up with them? So, for example, you know, me and my tiny classes, right? I can, I will email them twice. And then if I get no response from them, I have this magic button that I can hit and say, I'm worried about this person and, and the college will track the person down and make sure everything's okay or whatever. But I, that, you know, so with my 40 to 50 students that I have, I'm able to do that. So what about students that ghost you or disappear or whatever? Do you have some kind of support to help with finding them? We do. We actually, I was, literally just in a meeting with one of our new vice provosts to make it better. Um, we heavily use our TAs as well to help with this. So um, we make sure whether it's as part of experiential or it's just kind of a interactive lecture that day, we always have at least one sort of classroom response. And that's kind of how we do our attendance. Right. Um, and so at the end of we usually have our TAs do it every two weeks because every one week gets a little bit overwhelming. But they will download that and upload it because it's worth a small amount of points. So they upload it into Canvas and they can quickly and we have it, we have them do it within their discussion sections. So each TA is only having to deal, they teach four discussions. So they're still dealing with 180 students, but it's less than 700. Um, but if we kind of if they notice that they've been gone multiple days in a row, they can let us know. Um, and especially if they miss discussion multiple, like tw two weeks, even though that's only one thing students tend to go to discussion a lot because they find it helpful. Um, and so then we want to know. And once they tell us, we have what we call a student engagement roster um, that we can send the student a message. Theoretically, it also goes to their advisor um, because we have our advisors are all through the college. Mm -hmm. And then that's where the like into the ether happens, because sometimes we will get students who immediately write back and they're like, thank you for reaching out. Um, you know, I was really sick this week and I didn't think anyone cared or, you know, I didn't think anyone would notice. Um, and so that that's always nice. It's the ones that don't email us back. It's like if you don't come to class, if you don't email, we have limited support. So right now what we do is we have a care report. And it sounds like what you said, where we can click and say, hey, we haven't heard from the student. They haven't gotten back to us. And with IU, somebody from IU will get will get in touch with that student in 24 hours. One of the downsides to that. Yeah, sorry. We don't hear anything back from that. So when I submit a care report, it's just like, okay, I'm trusting that somebody's going to contact this person in 24 hours, but I hear nothing of that. Um, so what we are trying to do is build in some, so we're working with the vice provost, but build in some sort of follow-up system, like the advisor reaches out and then loops us into like a summary email or something like that, where we can then be involved in the process. So we're still working on it, but we do reach out if we see like a pattern of them not being there. Yeah, I encourage you to push pretty hard on that because if the care team didn't didn't email me back and say, yeah. 
hey, we have no person, idea. you know, just, they just sort of say that we got a hold of this person and this is what they said. I may still never see the student again, but at least I know they're alive and yeah. Yeah. And we, and that's the thing. And a lot of, and we'll keep emailing. We found that sometimes students just get fed up with the fact that we're still emailing them and they won't email us back. Um, and so that, you know, persistence can sometimes pay off, but yeah, we are working with them to figure out, you know, and, and not just chemistry, but across all of our, especially math, physics and chemistry and bio. So your huge incoming courses, because we're also dealing with first years. So they have a lot of other pressures besides just, you know, class, but they're also adjusting to college where things can go wrong. So yeah, we're definitely trying to find a better follow-up. Good. Yeah, I find students are very appreciative uh, when when they get that email. Well, I don't know how appreciative, but they're they, they're very responsive, you know, when they get that email that says, hey, you know, what's what's going on? You know, they you know, to, just to know that that you care and that you're mm -hmm. looking out for them. I think, yeah, and especially in a large class, I mean, that's where technology is so valuable. I would have no idea in unless they sit front row and I started not seeing them, but just for, for them to feel seen, right? For them to feel like somebody notices I'm not here and I didn't think that that was going to happen. Let me ask a quick question. Hi, thanks, Megan, for um, that great, great talk. Um, I was curious about, and something I've kind of thought about in my own active learning classes is how do we keep students from just Googling the answers to things? Um, and I was thinking in some of the spaces that you were describing, they might be really tempted, right? <laughs> like to just look it up. Well, I'm sure I saw that somewhere or I'm just gonna go look up what that's supposed to be. So what do you do to encourage them to like really try to make estimates themselves, you know, and how do you manage that in the classroom setting when it's so big? Um, yeah, they're going to be on their devices. And in fact, sometimes that's just the way they're even interacting with the material to begin with. Um, but how do we keep them focused on kind of making their own effort besides just relying on Google? Absolutely. So um, I have found I will say when we send them out, um, we tell them they have to take pictures and they can take I'm sure they could they can screenshot it, but they actually get really competitive as groups. And everything they've taken seems to be a fairly like actual picture, which is fun. Um, and so sometimes we'll have them like, oh, submit your cell phone, you know, not your cell phone, submit your photo or something like that. Um, in the classroom, the recitations aren't as much of an issue because we do have a much lower ratio. So just having the people walking around um, in the large lecture sections, same thing. We have a lot of people walking around, um, which does help, especially because I, I will do it. My TAs will do it. And my UTINs will be like, oh, that, oh, are you buying that on Amazon today? Like, we'll, we'll actually call them out on something or we'll be like, hey, right? Like, Google's not going to take your test for you. And we kind of do it in a joking manner, but usually all it takes is once and they're like, oh my gosh, they noticed and that person stops. Um, sometimes we will ban devices for a particular aspect, right? Um, so even if we're going to have them submit an answer, we'll say like, okay, we're going to do this demo for the next five minutes no devices. Like we don't want to see your laptop up. We don't want to see your phone out just talk about it. And then we say, okay, you have 30 seconds to submit. Like we're going to open the question. Now you have 30 seconds or something like that, where it's a fairly short time frame, So not too long to really Google and look at it. Yeah. Um, and then same idea with the data. I realized that we are very quickly going to get to the point where they can like snap a shot of the data set and like upload it and whatever. Um, <laughs> but for now, at least we have found when we're using real data sets, right? When we create messy science, that is harder for them to just Google. Um, and I think it's in a way more valuable, especially if they're going to go on to graduate school. Um, so that's a, and it, at some point we take the hit on, on some students, but I will, I do find that the more we as a teaching team get excited about it and talk about like why we think it's effective. And um, we use our UTINs a lot, not just for teaching, but they will kind of share their experiences um, and kind of things that helped them and what tips they learned. And students listen to them so much better than they listen to us, even if they're saying the same thing. And Absolutely. so that is also really valuable. So if a UTIN, especially if they're honest, they're like, yeah, for the first exam, I sat there and I was like Googling as I was doing my homework. And then all of a sudden the exam hit and I couldn't do it. Right. 
like when they're actually really honest about what didn't go well, students will pick up on that a little bit. But I find just the more bodies you can have walking around is really useful. And we do have to be careful about banning devices, which is why we don't have technology-free classrooms because a lot of our disability student services, like yeah. that will require it for some of it. But mm -hmm. usually if we're banning it for a discussion aspect, like that's not an issue. If it will be an issue, we usually know at the beginning of the semester because we'll get that information and then we can adjust how we're going to run the semester a little bit so that student wouldn't feel like, hey, they got a device and I didn't. Um, so we can adjust, but that one actually rarely happens if it's discussion based. I, I sometimes toward the beginning of class, if we're doing a demo or something like that, I will say, okay, just you know, screens down just for a minute. Yeah. Yep. And again, because I I'm very loose about technology. If they want their phones out and their computers out, I don't worry about no. it too much. Um, and that's in a stadium place where I really can't see, I can't see what they've got on their screens. But sometimes I'll just say screens down and 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 they'll do that. And then lots of times they they won't reopen them again. <laughs> you know, you just encouraged it once. Um, but I don't do it very often, you know, only when yeah. I really want them to, to, to have screens down. 